in this video, I will tell you the whole Foneta story, how this came about and everything that, that followed thereafter. So this goes back to about 2006. And um, that was the time when I was mixing on an album for my band in my home studio. Uh, but my little daughter was born at that time and she slept in the room upstairs. Listening on speakers wasn't really an option. And I used a headphone and, um, and had an interface with a headphone output on it. And I was trying to get somewhere with this. And usually I worked in the evenings and made a mix and I took it to the uh, burned the CD, got it in the car, drove to work, listened to it in the car. And I was so disappointed. My mixes just sounded not good. And um, I just really wondered why that is. And I was also thinking, hey, how many people do have a similar issue the, uh, like me, I mean, maybe you don't have a, a room that have had that is sounding well, has acoustic treatment and everything like that. If you're working from your bedroom studio, yeah, it's not ideal acoustically. So a headphone and being capable of mixing on headphones, that would be cool. But I was bad. I was really bad at it. And, and my mixes sounded thin, very narrow. No reverbs weren't really audible uh, or were just vanished into the background and i started to to think about why that actually is but before that i was i was also evenly concerned with the fact of of, of ear fatigue on headphones i just literally couldn't wear the headphone for half an hour or three quarters of an hour and then i had to have a break it was just like too stressy and um i was thinking Maybe when we use our 120 volt rail technology and, and make a headphone with that or an amplifier based on that technology that this would help. And um, because the, the relaxation when you, when you listen to this uh, technology, it's just, it's a different ball game. And yeah, I asked Wolf, hey, could you make me uh, uh, like a headphone amplifier type of thing and then try that out? That out? Yeah, yeah, why not? And typical Wolf, I think it was pretty much the next morning, he came up with a breadboard, had this, everything on there. Yeah, you plug it in there, put a bit of power on there and then try it. So I was mixing um, the following evenings and I, went, and I realized that I could, I was mixing for two hours and I took the headphone off and I was like, did I just really like have the world distinct for two hours and I didn't have, well, okay. That, that was the point where you just felt you were onto something. That is good. Okay, that's the first really good step. You could, you could listen for long and it doesn't ear fatigue you. That's cool. Now, when you listen about the, or when you think about, sorry, when you think about the effects that, that happen when you move your speakers from in front of you to your sides and extremely close to the ear, what is changing? What, all the things that are then different. Because the intention that I had, and that is still the case, is that I wanted to be able to throw a mix that I made on headphones onto the studio speakers and have a similar, if not equal, sound representation. That was the key. It, I, I didn't like the idea of working in some fancy other studio place with an DSP generated artificial room that I was supposed to be in there and mix because that wouldn't give me the benefit of listening at home and comparing and do something on headphones, but I could also work on speakers. And that was the same thing. So the idea was to mimic your studio acoustics onto your headphones. So what do you need to do for that? So the first thing is what is called crossfeed. And that is something that has been around for um, a long time. One of the earliest things I could find, I found was from Bell Labs in early 60s. And they were talking about positioning the sensation of hearing to the rim of your head. That's how they described it. So basically from here to there. And they introduced crossfeed, which actually means that it's that portion that travels 
from let's say the right speaker to the left ear and vice versa. So the, if your room is very alive and you got lots of reflections, um, obviously there is more reflected sound coming to the opposite side uh, than in a dry room. So the crossfeed is what scientifically is called the interaural level level difference and in in the phonator matrix there is there is a, a filter in use that also shapes the frequency response of that sound that travels to the other ear if you go to the other videos that we made there is also a video where you can listen on headphones and you can hear exactly what is going to the other ear so we made separate audio examples for that that's worth taking a listen to now there the filters are required because there are the frequencies and travel around your head and then get to the other ear and while traveling around the head there is a lot of frequencies that are bounced off your forehead and so typically the frequency range is that up to like 500 hertz everything appears on the other side in lesser level of course at five to six hundred hertz, it slowly degrades until at about ten kilohertz, nothing appears on the other side. So these filters need to be in place, but these filters need to be uh, related to the angle that you choose for placing um, that our your speakers placed in. So the further that's apart, the more frequency scale or the the the, the area of ref of um, deflection of frequencies around your forehead is larger therefore you need a different filter response now this is all catered for in in the phonator but that brings me to the angle and the angle is actually this the, the physical placement of your speakers and typically what is called the so-called standard setting is 30 degrees which means from the center 30 degrees to the left and 30 degrees to the right so there's a total angle of 60 degrees and uh, there's a story for that because I was at that point I got really interested in is there a standard on uh, then there might be a paper uh, so I'm going to look for that paper I couldn't find one so it was just not uh, available nowhere really so I uh, called up uh, one of my friends Fritz uh, Fei from Studio Magazine he is he is not just the owner of that magazine but he's also like building studios for long he's just a, a wizard in all of that um and and he was like oh i didn't i i never thought about it really he said i'm gonna i'm gonna research it the same time i was talking to professor dieter lecture in Düsseldorf from the university and asked him if he had any insight um, so, uh, and he was puzzled by the question as well. He said, I'm going to investigate. And he came up with a paper. He sent that over to me. It was like 80 pages on written in Dutch by a guy by the name of De Boer. Uh, and that was in 1942 in Eindhoven at Philips. Um, I didn't get it all because it was written in Dutch. I do speak a bit, but I, I, that that was complex nonetheless they referred to some recordings or some uh, um, stereo um, settings they didn't call it stereo they call it dual yeah binaural they had like vocabulary that i wasn't really that isn't used any, anymore really for to describe that anyway in they refer to um to a recording happening in vienna in 1916 um and uh it was this was funny because Later, when we had the product in the market, I had uh, I had a lecture on at the university um, about all of these uh, um, mixing on headphones things and the phonetic matrix. And there were more people to uh, yeah there to to talk to the students. And one was an, a, a professor uh, that who worked with Sennheiser, and he pulled that picture and put it on, on the screen, that picture of that recording in 1916 with a little chamber orchestra and, uh, and, and, a, and a thick carpet. Um, and there were just like two uh, um, yeah, microphones, which are basically the pieces that you had from the old telephones, the mouthpiece and the earpiece. So the mouse, mouthpieces, they were in the room with the, with the uh, orchestra. Funny enough, it was about three meters apart, like the Decca tree 
with the world. So, uh, and the wires went under the carpet into the other room where you could stick the earpieces to your ears and you could listen to that uh, chamber orchestra in stereo. At that point, it, it dawned on me that there isn't a standard. There is no paper about the 30 degrees. And um, thinking about it, and, and then I came to the conclusion that it m probably has to do with the fact that if you select an even-sided triangle, um, that where all, yeah, all the sides are the same length, then all the angles are the same. So it's three times 60 degrees. And that means from the center to one side, it's 30 degrees. So basically, if you take a look at, at it from that perspective, it's just the most simple math that you can apply. And I guess that was the reason, because from there on, you can just calculate and there was no listening angle into it because everything was the same. Maybe that's, if you, if you know anything about that, please put it in the comments. I would love to hear it and I would love to read about more on that. It's a bit nerdy, but yeah, aren't we all nerdy? So, um, where was I? Um, on the, uh, so on the angle, um, when you move a speaker from the center to like 30 degrees to the right, the difference it makes in time for sound to travel to the opposite ear is about 270 microseconds. So about a quarter of a millisecond. That's actually really minimal, but it is relevant. Um, luckily, we can do all of this, these kind of delays in, uh, in, in analog technology. We don't need to go ADA conversion to do that. You can go full range with a um, all-pass filter design and move the face for that. So that's all done and realized in 120 volt rail technology in analog in, in the Fonito products. Um, when you move it further outwards, you get to like 90 degrees angle and uh, that's about uh, 680 microseconds, if I'm not mistaken. When you set up um, the, the matrix, what, what you, and as I said, what you want to achieve is that you can put your mix on headphones, on speakers, you keep on working, then you go back to speakers, uh, to headphones for whatever reason, and you hear the same mix and you can proceed mixing and it translates to the speakers later on again. So how do you set up the matrix? That is actually not that difficult. Actually, it's really simple because what you only have to do is you take a track you know, I usually take a track with uh, a, a hi-hat to half right or half left, wherever it's positioned, and I listen to that position very closely on the speakers. Then I put on the headphones, and normally on the headphones, this will appear further out. So you take the cross-feed control, and you the more you dial it in, or the more you s switch to higher values, the more that image gets smaller and the hi-hat moves inwards until it reaches that point where it's where it appears on the speakers so that's that matching you do with your ears and with um with the song you know that's done so the second value you need to set is the angle parameter the angle value and uh, there we have two selections the, the selection is different on the pro side compared to the hi-fi side on the pro side we got six values on the hi-fi side we only have four values we have like 15 degrees 22, 30, 40, 55, and 75 degrees. So the, um, the inner values, 22 up to like 55, they're identical on both units for pro and hi-fi, but um, the outer values, the 15 degrees, which is very narrow, this is to be used when you mix on speakers that are sitting next to your video monitor. And the 75, um, degrees is used when you uh, work in a broadcast van, for example, where the speakers are usually very wide apart, um, with you sitting next to a lot of screens on the wall of, the, of that van. On the Pro product, we also introduced a new parameter that uh, hasn't been discussed before by any literature. That is what we call the center level. I usually found it difficult to put the center, uh, the phantom center vocals, for example, at the right level. Usually they appeared 
to be a bit um, too loud. So I needed to compensate for that in the matrix and, and, and reduce um, that level uh, just slightly. It's, it's for me almost um, a dB is, is enough to, to achieve that. So that value that we have on the, on the monitors um, is uh, six values in steps of a third of a dB. You only need this when you mix. You don't need this when you play it back. So there is also a feature where you switch the matrix on and it only switches on for um, the crossfeed and the angle and it leaves the, the, the center level um, bypassed. That is uh, for playback. And when you mix, you engage the center level as well. And then that brings me to the, uh, the models that we came up with over the years. This model here in the background, this is the uh, original Fonitor, uh, from which we started to design in 2007. I think it got to the market in 2008 or 2009. It was a real success. In the beginning, we just thought, ah, I don't know if people really bother about mixing on headphones because headphones weren't used for mixing. And, and, and a lot of engineers were like, I don't mix on headphones. I just use headphones to to check, to zoom into audio, to check on details if the cuts and the edits are flawless and stuff like that. So it was more for a fault detection than for real mixing. But luckily, around that time, um, headphone manufacturers came up with really, really good headphones. And it was a, there was a new scene arising around um, uh, headphone fanatics, audio files that used headphones. And we soon learned, um, after we put the Fonita 2, the successor product of this one, um, into the market in about 2011, 2012, that 50% of our production was sold to hi-fi people. And we were like puzzled because we never thought about that market, never had to do anything with that market. But uh, when this happened and our dealers, our pro audio dealers told us that most or 50% was sold to hi-fi people, we just really thought, hmm, that's an interesting market that we should take a look at. So the current professional fidelity hi-fi line is entirely based on the Fonitor 2 design. Because at that time we were thinking people want to have like a power amplifier or a phono stage or a pre-amplifier accompanying the headphone amplifier. So here it is, that's the line and that fits together. Uh, so the Fonitor 2 also had like a feature for the Hi-Fi people where you can remotely control the volume. And, uh, but I, I just didn't find it really nice to have another volume, con another infrared um, remote control lying around for just two functions, volume up, volume down. And um, we were thinking about, wouldn't it be cool if, if the unit, the headphone amplifier learns the commands? And, and that is what we did. There is a chip in there that, uh, that you can teach the commands of your remote control and you use two functions that you usually don't use for exactly that volume up, volume down. Later in the 2015, 16, we started to look at uh, uh, dedicated headphones for the hi-fi, uh, headphone amplifier, sorry, for the hi-fi community. And one thing that was a big topic was uh, balanced headphones. When we first encountered that term, I, I was puzzled. I was thinking balanced because usually balance in, in the professional audio world means that you use this for signal, um, to, to transport signals over a longer distance and to erase or let's say re, um, reject interference um, with the differential amplifier that is in the receiving path. Um, and all of that is not in a headphone um, and there is no differential stage anywhere. So basically it is two amplifiers that uh, one is, is driving plus and minus for the left side and the other plus and minus for the right side. Whereas on a standard setup, you have one powers the left or the other powers the right, just plus or minus with a common ground. Now, 
I don't know why they call it balanced. I think it's the wrong term. But maybe just because it's Nick Solaris socket, they think that's associated with that and they use that term, but it's actually misleading. So then there are two things you need to you need to know about this. When you the sonically there is a difference. On the one hand, the fact that you have two amplifiers operating sort of independent from another, um, depending on the material, you get like a slight little phase drifts in these amp amps. That results in a slightly bigger um, stereo image. And that's because people then say, yeah, when I, when I listen to a balance F1, there's more room, there's more air, it sounds a bit bigger. Yes, because of that. So it's more of an artifact, uh, a result of the system than part of the music. And, and for me, as an as a engineer, as a sound engineer, I wouldn't want to have that. I just want to know what, it's, what is there and not introduce any effects. So that's also why in the pro world you usually don't find balanced uh, headphone connections. Um, but the good thing on balancing is that you have two amplifiers and you have more the double the juice on the headphone and that is sometimes really nice to have a, a, a steady as most stable uh, bass response. Yeah, I have to admit that's actually cool about it. So the first headphone amplifier that we designed for the Hi-Fi community was the 42X and that was uh, also a pre-amplifier just like the 42. You can connect speakers to it or power amplifiers with speakers or uh, to it um, and you can switch between headphone listening and uh, speaker listening. We introduced an option for a DA converter in, in the Fonita X. Um, later we came up with the Fonita XE, which we have over here. And that's our flagship model. And because people really didn't, the mixture of, of, of speaker listening, headphone listening, most people really stick to one thing and they just want to have the, the headphone listening and that as good as possible. At least that's in the hi-fi world the case. So we came up with the Fonita XE that um, also has like the biggest deck option built in, the option of our biggest deck, the same deck that we use in the Mercury Mastering DA converter. Um, and it also has little added features like um, the headphone outputs for balance and unbalance. They're also on the back. And you can switch on the front because some people really don't want to have the cable of the uh, of the headphone hanging in the front, so you can put it to the back and it's and it's visually gone. Um, that's kind of good. The pro product, the latest that we came out with, is the Fonita Three deck that came on the market last year. That also now has the option of uh, not the option. We built two models, one with and one without um, a deck, the same big the DAC 768 that we put into the Mercury uh, mastering compressor. And also for the Pro guys, bear in mind, you can put the, the Fonita 3 into our expansion rack. Then now you have a fit for 19 inch racks with that. And you can connect the output to a passive speaker selector. And you can see you can have four speakers connected which is cool because then you have near field, uh, full range, midfield, and an aux, whatever. You can connect all of these to it. It's actually a small mastering console then because it gives you all of the features. You also have like input uh, face reversal for left and right, um, mono switches, uh, solo for left and right, all the functions that you need in monitoring for the pro world. Obviously on the HiFi model, we don't do that because it's not required, not needed. So yeah, that was our journey through uh, the Fonitor and how it came about. I hope you liked it and um, yeah, leave comments behind if you want to and see you next time. Till then, have a good time. Bye-bye.